All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about aneurysms. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about dilated aneurysms uh, as well as dissecting aneurysms, aneurysms, how these can uh, lead to both thoracic and abdominal aneurysms and what the signs and symptoms we might expect when uh, we have a patient with an aneurysm. So first, I want to start off by going over the layers of the vessel wall so that we have an idea of what we're talking about. So uh, to review the layers of the vessel wall, the innermost layer that we're talking about here is the tunica intima. And this is the layer of the vessel that is going to be closest to the blood. So this is the lumen here. Uh, and this is obviously where our blood is going to be flowing. The middle layer that we have here is the tunica media. And this is the uh, layer of our vessel that's going to house our smooth muscle. This is what's going to give the vessel integrity. It's going to allow it to uh, constrict and to stretch um, and going to make sure that uh, it isn't going to balloon out like we're going to see in an aneurysm. The outermost layer is our tunica externa or tunica adventitia, and it's the outermost layer of the vessel. Uh, and this is the layer of the vessel that's going to be closest to the abdominal organs or thoracic organs. Um, in those cavities. Finally, we have in our larger, ves uh, larger vessels or larger arteries, as we would see in the aorta, we have the vasa visorum. And this is a layer of vessels. This is uh, blood supply that's actually going to give blood to the smooth muscle of the tunica media. Um, so because those smooth muscles are going to demand oxygen and they're going to need oxygen to perform their function, they actually have their own blood supply, which is coming from this vas uh, vasa visorum. So we have our tunica intima, which is the innermost layer that's going to sit uh, closest to the blood. We have the tunica media, which is the middle layer, which is going to um, have the smooth muscles and give the vessel integrity. We have the tunica externa, which is the outermost layer, and it's closest to the uh, peritoneal or the thoracic space when we're talking about the thorax or the abdomen. Finally, we have the vasa visorum, which is the blood supply that goes to the smooth muscle. This is how the smooth muscle is getting the blood and the perfusion of the oxygen that it needs in order to perform its function. So what happens when someone has a aneurysm is either we have a dilation of the arterial wall. So what that means is that the arterial wall can no longer perform its function or doesn't have the integrity and it starts to balloon out. Or it can have a dissection in the, anterior, uh, the arterial wall. And what this means is that blood actually infiltrates the tunica media and starts stripping away that smooth muscle. So in one, we simply have a dilation or a weakening of the wall. And in another, in the dissecting aneurysm, we actually have destruction of the vessel wall. And there's a few things that can lead, uh, there's a few things that can lead to an aneurysm. Or there's a few risk factors that we should talk about. So if we're talking about risk factors or things that can uh, lead to someone having uh, an aneurysm. The first is uh, congenital factors. So people who have uh, fam uh, first level family members who have had an aneurysm before are much more likely to have an aneurysm in the future. We've talked about things like Marfan syndrome uh, that puts people at a higher risk of an, of an aneurysm. And those are congenital diseases or genetic diseases uh, that predispose someone to aneurysm. So they could leave a to lead a totally healthy lifestyle, but they're still at risk of developing aneurysm as a result of these congenital factors. The other thing, a couple other things that can lead to aneurysm um, are hypertension. So someone who has high blood pressure, the uh, turbulence of the blood flow and the destruction of the walls that can occur as a result can lead to aneurysm. Smoking or the production of free radicals from that smoking that damages the vessel wall can uh, lead to deterioration and to aneurysm. Infections. So the damage that an infection can do to the a uh, vessel wall can lead to an aneurysm. And finally, atherosclerosis. And what I want to do is kind of dive into a couple of these in more depth to explain how something like hypertension or atherosclerosis is actually going to cause someone to get an aneurysm. So the first one I want to talk about here is atherosclerosis. So uh, if you take a look again at this kind of first diagram or this one here, we talk about how ather uh, atherosclerosis can lead to aneurysm. Uh, again, you can see the layers of the vessel wall that we we're talking about before. So here we have the intima, here we have the uh, tunica media, here's the amatitia and the vasovasora. But obviously in the middle of this vessel wall, what we can see is an atherosclerotic plaque. And that plaque has built up 
over years of maybe high blood pressure or someone having an increase in cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, all of those risk factors that can lead to atherosclerosis. But what starts to happen is we have this plaque buildup. And one of the things that you have to remember is that one of the key characteristics of this plaque is that it recruits smooth muscle from the tunica media. So these little red um, cells that we're seeing amongst the plaque, or these are our, these yellow cells are our foam cells or our fat-laden foam cells or macrophages that have eaten up all these lipid molecules to help form the plaque. But one of the things that happens as this plaque forms or these foam cells form is we have recruitment of smooth muscle. And that recruitment or that smooth muscle is coming from the tunica media. So we're recruiting smooth muscle from the tunica media. So you can see in this wall or this diseased vessel wall, what has happened is we have lost uh, smooth muscle. So if we look up in this aspect of the vessel, we have all this smooth muscle that's tightly packed and can perform its function. But when we look in this diseased uh, part of the vessel, we have a loss of smooth muscle. But what's happened is that smooth muscle has been recruited from the tunica media to enter the plaque and it has entered into the plaque. So one of the issues with atherosclerosis or atherosclerosis leading uh, to uh, aneurysm is we have a loss of smooth muscle, or we start to see a uh, reduction in smooth muscle in the tunica media. The other problem is that as this plaque starts to encroach or it starts to push in towards the lumen and out towards the tunica externa, so we can obviously see that this plaque is moving in towards the lumen of the vessel, but it is also moving uh, outwards towards our uh, tunica adventitia, and it's pushing all of those structures outward. So we can see this kind of outward movement of the vessel. And the problem with that is that it starts to impinge on the blood supply. So whereas we look up here, we look at these arteries here, we can see that we have the vasovasorum is supplying oxygen or it's penetrating into the uh, vessel wall, and it's we're able to have lots of oxygen supply to the smooth muscle. The problem as we move into the disease part of the vessel, or a vessel that has atherosclerosis, is we have destruction or we have these uh, vessels being pushed out. They're not able to penetrate as deeply into the vessel wall and we lose oxygenation and we start to have a decrease in oxygenation to the uh, tunica media. So the other problem with atherosclerosis is we start to see a decreased oxygenation of the tunica media which is ultimately going to lead to some necrosis and fibrosis of these cells, and they're gonna lose their integrity, or we're not gonna be able to have that elastic function uh, of the tunica media, or it's not gonna uh, hold the vessels in place. And this is one of the things that can cause the dilation of the vessel. So one of the big problems, one of the big things that's gonna to lead to someone potentially getting an aneurysm is atherosclerosis. The other thing that I wanna talk about is hypertension. So we'll talk a little bit about how hypertension uh, can lead to someone developing an aneurysm. So in a normal vessel or someone who does not have hypertension, what we're looking for is laminar flow of blood through the vessel. And laminar flow means that this blood is flowing um, in a straight line, kind of unrestricted, um, and has a nice even flow. And if you picture a tap turning on, the water flows out of that tap in a laminar fashion, or it uh, flows out kind of without hindrance. The problem is that when someone starts to develop hypertension, so we'll kind of make this vessel a little bit smaller, and we start to constrict the space in which blood has to flow, blood begins to flow in a much more kind of turbulent nature. Um, and what that means is that our blood starts to act like almost a rapid as it Tra travels through the vessel, and this turbulence is going to damage the vessel wall. So as this increase in turbulence, and, and this is happening again over a longer period of time, it's not happening a day or a week, this is developing over years of someone having hypertension. As we start to see this turbulence uh, impacting the vessel wall, we start to have persistent damage. Uh, of the vessel walls. We start to see these cells start to become damaged. Um, just like if you were to stand and punch a wall over and over and over again, eventually you're gonna damage that wall. And we start to see ischemia and damage to these cells. And as the cells are damaged from this consistent, um, from this consistent uh, increase in turbulence um, and the, the blood kind of pounding against the wall, what starts to happen is we have cell death uh, the cells will be replaced, but they become much more fibrous. So we have the kind of these fibrous tissues replacing our typical cells. And the problem with that is A, that these fibrous tissues 
do not have the elastic properties that our previous vessel had. Um, and B is that they start to uh, encroach and uh, impinge the oxygen supply. So one of the things that we see with this hypertension is we have damage to the vessel walls. Damage to these vessel walls leads to cell death or eventually leads to uh, cell death or normal cell death. We have um, replacement of those cells or we have uh, some sort of cleanup and healing that happens. But as a result, uh, we're going to replace it with more of a scar tissue or fibrotic tissue. So we see fibrotic tissue replaces our normal cells after the cell death. And two things happen. This fibrotic tissue does not have the elastic properties of our typical tunica media. And the other problem is that it starts to uh, impair blood supply. Or it impairs the ability to get blood uh, to the tunica media of these vessels. And as a result, we start to see weakening of the vessel wall. So the vessel wall uh, weakens. And these are two of the, of the main causes of atherosclerosis. So like we said, in after uh, or two of the main causes of aneurysm or vessel weakening. Like we said, in atherosclerosis, what happens is <clears throat> we have this uh, clot that's going to, or this plaque that's going to encroach on the vessel wall. It's going to steal smooth muscle and decrease oxygenation, which decreases the integrity of the vessel wall. Or with hypertension, what's happening is this increase in turbulence leads to destruction of the vessel wall. Uh, replace, uh, the, we see the uh, replacement of normal cells with fibrotic tissues, and we also decrease oxygen supply. So in both cases, the vessel loses those elastic smooth muscle cells that are required to have a good integrity or a good strong vessel wall, and we get this weakening. So what happens when we have something like congenital problem, hypertension, smoking, infection that weakens the vessel wall is we can lead to a dilated aneurysm. So this is one of the types of aneurysms that we're going to talk about. So we can have a dilated aneurysm. And all that means is that the uh, we've lost that integrity of the vessel wall and we can start to see the vessel balloon out. So if this was our normal kind of aortic arch leading down towards our femoral arteries. What happens in a uh, in an aneurysm is either we have a dilated balloon aneurysm or saccular aneurysm, we can call it, where instead of having this good integrity of the vessel wall, we start to see it ballooning out on both sides. So obviously we're going to store a lot of blood in that aneurysm. So this is our saccular aneurysm. Um, you can see we basically formed this sac here where we've lost the integrity and the, the vessel wall dilates. Or we can have a fusiform aneurysm. And a fusiform aneurysm is just where only one side of the vessel has lost integrity or the ability of the smooth muscle to control the vessel wall. And what happens is uh, we have just one side. Uh, dilates out. So these are two forms of dilated aneurysm. So a saccular and fusor form aneurysm are forms of dilated aneurysm. And they are some of the most common types of aneurysm uh, that pe people are going to experience. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is another type of aneurysm we should talk about, and this is a dissecting aneurysm. Now, dissecting aneurysm can occur from all of the same things we talked about. So uh, someone can get a dissecting aneurysm from a congenital problem, from hypertension, from atherosclerosis, from diabetes, any of those types of things. But the difference is that in a uh, dissecting aneurysm is we actually start to see destruction of the tunica media. So we're going to talk about a dissecting aneurysm. And what's happening here is we start to have destruction of the uh, tunica media. So what first starts to happen is we start losing this, uh, the integrity of our vessel wall and blood starts to be able to infiltrate the tunic intima, or it's kind of uh, making its way into the tunica intima. And it doesn't take long before there is a passageway between the, uh, the vessel lumen or where all of our blood is housed and the tunica media. And the problem is that as blood can continue to make its way into this portion of our vessel, it can strip away our tunica media. 
So essentially what happens in a dissecting aneurysm is we lose integrity of the vessel wall or we start to lose the integrity of our tunica intima. And as our tunica intima is lost and blood can start, start making its way into the tunica media, it actually starts to tear away our tunica media. We start to see the smooth muscle of our tunica media uh, stripped away. And if you think about what that means is now uh, we obviously are going to have blood in the lumen. So we have blood traveling through our lumen as we normally would. But there's also another pathway in which we can have blood flow. Blood can actually make its way into the tunica media that has had all the smooth muscles stripped away and can fill the tunica media. And this is what we call a false channel. So in people who have a dissecting aneurysm, they have the formation of a false channel in which blood can actually flow outside of the typical lumen. So now we have blood filling the tunica media, and the only thing that is stopping this blood from entering our peritoneal or our thoracic space is this tiny little uh, tunica externa, or, or the part of the vessel that's not designed to, to simply keep blood out of there. So this person's at high risk of rupture. So again, to kind of talk about uh, what's happening here is we have some sort of risk factor that's increasing this, uh, the chance of this uh, to happen. So the person has some sort of risk factor. Over time, we start to see destruction of the tunica intima. Following destruction of the tunica intima, the blood can now infiltrate the tunica media. So blood begins to infiltrate uh, the tunica media. And as the blood infiltrates the tunica media, it can begin to strip away the uh, smooth muscle cells. So we start to see stripping away of smooth muscle, which obviously is going to decrease the integrity of the vessel wall. We're going to lose the elasticity of the vessel wall. And now we have a false channel created where there's lots of blood um, that's filling the tunica media. We have blood living in the tunica media. So we have false channel formation. So obviously this person, again, is at high risk of rupture as the blood begins to uh, fill, the, uh, fill the tunica media. Um, any aneurysm that is greater than six centimeters in diameter um, puts the patient at high risk of rupture. And that is uh, in any of these types of aneurysms. So it could be in our dilated aneurysm that we've talked about here, it could be in our dissecting aneurysm, as it gets to be around that six centimeter mark, that's when this patient is at high risk uh, of, uh, of rupture of that aneurysm. So as we move on, what I'd like to start talking about now is the signs and symptoms that we can expect in these patients. Um, so like we kind of talked about before, there's uh, two types or two common types of aneurysm. We can see a thoracic aneurysm or a abdominal aneurysm. Uh, we're going to talk first about the thoracic aneurysm, and this is occurring at the aortic arch. Uh, and we typically start to see aneurysms forming at uh, areas of higher pressure. So uh, places like uh, bifurcations or arches where blood has to move around uh, an arch, it's going to increase pressure and increase the chance of someone developing an aneurysm. So some of the things that we can see, and um, these aren't always going to be present unless we start to see rupture of the aneurysm or their aneurysm gets very large. Most people don't know they have one until A, it either gets to a point where um, it does start impacting them and usually it's quite large at that point, or it begins to rupture. So we're talking about more of the kind of severe signs and symptoms that go, around with these go along with these types of aneurysms. So the first is if someone has a thoracic aneurysm, especially one that's tearing or is uh, ruptured, um, they will complain of a, a, a sharp, uh, stabbing, ripping chest pain. So often describe it as a ripping, tearing chest pain. And again, this is uh, due to the fact that the vessel wall is being destroyed. Um, it often feels as though uh, it's tearing into the back. So we see a little bit of referred pain into the back. So a uh, patient may describe it as kind of a boring hole into their back. Or pain that presents right in between the shoulder blades. So these people might complain of a ripping, tearing chest pain, goes towards the back, and they feel it in the middle of their shoulder, uh, shoulder blade, blades. The other thing that we can often see with a thoracic aneurysm is asymmetrical radial pulses or blood pressures. Um, so what that means is that uh, when we take a pulse uh, or a 
uh, or we take a pulse or we take a blood pressure, we are feeling it differently on uh, either side. So you might have a strong radial pulse on the right hand side and a weaker radial pul pulse on the left hand side, or you might have an asymmetrical blood pressure. And differences greater than 20 millimeters of mercury are what we are most concerned about. So, you know, five or 10, 10 um, millimeter mercury difference between the right and left is not a huge deal. But once we get getting, or once we start getting to that 20 millimeter mercury mark, and this person has these other signs and symptoms, we become, uh, our index of suspicion or the risk of this patient having an aneurysm is much higher. Now, part of the reason why we see that asymmetrical difference is due to where the uh, subclavian arteries come off of the aortic arch. So depending on where this aneurysm is, you might actually have the right subclavian. So this is our uh, subclavian artery here. So I'll just call it subclav. Our right subclavian artery coming off below the aneurysm and our left subclavian artery coming off above the aneurysm. And the problem here is that um, as blood begins to pool up or pool into this aneurysm, we're going to see a decrease in blood supply to the uh, right subclavian versus the left. Um, as a result, blood pressure will be higher in the uh, in the subclavian or the, the arteries fed by the subclavian coming off before the aneurysm rather than after. So this is why you get that asymmetrical difference in blood pressure or pulses between uh, patients. One of the other things that we can see um, in these patients is postural hypertension. So you may have someone who has uh, postural hypotension, or we can also call that uh, orthostatic hypotension. So you may hear it called orthostatic hypotension. And what that means is that the patient's blood pressure decreases while sitting or standing. So we start to see a decrease in blood pressure uh, while uh, sitting or standing, especially when we have uh, rapid changes. So if we set the patient up quickly or we stand the patient up quickly, they may have a, a drop in blood pressure. They might start to feel uh, lightheaded, dizzy, or all those symptoms that go along with, uh, with uh, acute hy uh, hypotension. And the reason for this is that we have lots of blood being stored in our artery. And the uh, artery or the, uh, the aortic arch here is not a capacitance vessel. It's not designed uh, to respond to rapid changes in blood pressure. So normally we would store lots of uh, blood in our uh, veins. And as we have these changes in blood pressure, we prov uh, provide more or less to the, to the right ventricle in terms of preload. What happens is as all this blood begins to store in the aneurysm, uh, it's now not available when the patient has this rapid change in blood pressure. So uh, when they sit up or stand up, their blood pressure falls, and they can't compensate as well for that. So they get this hypotension or lightheadedness or dizziness um, that goes along with the orthostatic hypotension. So that's something to be mindful of when we're, when we're managing these patients or dealing with these patients is the fact that their blood pressure uh, may fall as, as we uh, move them around. Another thing that you could see, and these are very late signs, um, and often, again, these, these are signs that are associated with rupture. As this aneurysm ruptures, we have kind of a tear in this aneurysm and blood starts to uh, leak out of the aneurysm into the uh, thoracic space. What we can start to see is things like uh, hemoptysis, so the patient starts coughing up blood, so we have uh, blood exiting into the lung fields, this is our lung back here, so as it fills the thoracic space, we actually have blood entering our lungs, so the patient may have hemoptysis. And very late stages, we can actually see tracheal shifting. And that would basically mean that we have so much blood filling this thoracic space that it's starting to push the trachea. This is our trachea here. It's starting to push our trachea to the opposite side. Um, so essentially, we're losing so much volume into that thoracic space that there's not enough space for the blood. And it starts actually shifting that trachea or pushing it to the alternative side. So you can actually see some uh, tracheal shifting. So those are our common symptoms that we will see in someone having a thoracic aneurysm. Um, now, if we move down further, we're going to talk about an abdominal aneurysm. So abdominal aneurysms are usually happening uh, somewhere before the bifurcation of the femoral arteries. So this is the uh, femoral arteries below here. So usually occurring below the bifurcation of the femoral arteries or our uh, renal arteries actually come off just above our femoral arteries. And sometimes we'll see... Uh, 
aneurysm formation just above the bifurcation of the renal arteries. And again, the reason for that is that as we have these bifurcations, or anytime the blood has to shift the way it's moving, we start to see an increased pressure, with the increased pressure at those areas. So again, someone who has a fairly significant abdominal uh, aortic or, uh, aneurysm can present with a, a certain uh, kind of presentation or number of signs and symptoms. So again, we're talking a, about an abdominal aneurysm. And some of the signs and symptoms we can see with this patient are a pulsating mass. So um, you can obviously see how we have the aneurysm presenting here. So as the patient lies flat, we may actually see the mass presenting in their abdomen. And obviously it's gonna pulsate because it's an artery and blood is moving through it. So you may actually see a pulsating mass in the abdomen. It's important if you see that, that we're not palpating it, we're not pushing on in any of those types of things because we don't want to perpetuate rupture at all. Um, again, the patient may complain of severe epigastric pain. Um, so this patient is gonna obviously complain of more abdominal pain. So they may complain of severe, uh, severe epigastric pain it may again feel as though it's a ripping, a tearing, or pain boring into the patient's back. Uh, so again, these are really more somatic kind of symptoms. The patient can pinpoint it, they know what it feels like. Uh, so ripping, a tearing, uh, boring. We said it can often radiate into the back or move into the back. You may also see this pain radiate uh, to the groin. So due to the location of it, the patient may uh, pain, uh, complain of some radiation to the groin. So we may say, uh, see uh, radiation to the groin, uh, even to the uh, buttocks or the legs. Um, so the pain may uh, radiate a little bit. These patients, just like the uh, thoracic aneurysm patients, we may see some orthostatic hypotension. So as they're storing so much blood into the aneurysm, uh, again, it's not available for when they have these changes in blood pressure when they need to uh, sit up or stand up. Uh, and these patients, because of the location, you may see a decrease in peripheral pulses or you might uh, see asymmetrical peripheral pulses. So now when we're check checking our pedal pulses or our femoral pulses, they are the ones that may be uh, asymmetrical. And again, that's based on uh, where the aneurysm is, if it's uh, storing or not giving as much blood to the right versus left femoral artery. So we might see um, asymmetrical uh, peripheral pulses, so pedal or uh, femoral. Or you may see absent or decrease, so a decrease or absent peripheral pulses. And again, if we're looking at the aneurysm that we've drawn here, because this one uh, is above both femoral arteries and we're gonna have all this blood storing in this aneurysm, we might see a decrease in blood flow uh, going to both of our femoral arteries. So this patient may have decreased uh, or absent peripheral pulses bilaterally. Finally, if we have an indication that this aneurysm has may, uh, may have ruptured, we could potentially see a dis distended abdomen. Um, the only issue here is that it takes about three liters of blood to distend the abdomen. So this would be a very late sign uh, if, if, it does, if it does occur. Um, so finally, if we're looking at aneurysm or we're looking at what is going to indicate that this aneurysm has ruptured, it is a, usually occurs suddenly and we start to see kind of some sudden symptoms. So we may have a sudden uh, decrease in blood pressure. So as that aneurysm ruptures, now the blood begins to fill the thoracic or the, uh, the abdominal cavities and we obviously can't uh, circulate that blood. Um, the patient will initially become tachycardic. So we'll see some compensation uh, for the fact that their blood volume is rapidly decreasing. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of these patients, they lead to, it leads to uh, sudden cardiac arrest. So if a large aneurysm ruptures, um, there is a chance that the, the patient is going to lead immediately to hemorrhagic shock, uh, and they will go into cardiac arrest. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of aneurysms. I hope that's a reasonable review of how a dilated versus a dissecting aneurysm can occur, as well as the differences between our thoracic aneurysm, our, um, our abdominal aneurysm, uh, or our AAA, uh, and then uh, what happens when this ruptures.